beautiful song that was just played. You know, you drown out the crowd when you say nothing at all. What more can tell of God's love than when he says to be still and know that I am God? That when he is silent, when you think he is silent, he's speak, speaking the loudest to you. And yet you have to be quiet to hear it. Just like it was with Elijah up on the mountain. When he goes to the cave and he sees the, the windstorm, the tempest. God's voice wasn't in it. He sees the fire. God's voice wasn't in it. He hears a small quiet. And that is God's voice. Isn't it wonderful? That you don't have to be the loudest. Okay, John, we know you're pretty loud. Contradict myself there. I don't try to be the loudest. It just happens. I'm Chaplain John Butler. I'm with Battle Line Ministries. And the ministry that I run, we go to Civil War reenactments to give the gospel to the soldiers and to the spectators that come to the events. Are we trying to... Uh, Keep up the war? No. We're trying to keep the history, to learn from our past. Because it was said by a very one, uh, uh, famous man that if those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Should we live in the past? No. We need to live for the future. And the future is Jesus Christ. But our past, just as Jesus Christ is our cornerstone, and as Jesus made Peter the rock of his church that he built his church on, our past is the foundation we build our lives on. And that foundation, the most important stone, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. <coughs> and why do we have that cornerstone? We have just celebrated, it was yesterday, Valentine's Day. Who, who had a Valentine? Sweet. It's, it's wonderful. I didn't have a Valentine. I, I haven't had a Valentine for years. But that's okay. Because God... If it's for me to have someone, God will give it to me. But I feel that God's using me in more things than just having someone to cuddle. He's using me to spread his message. Now, it says that it's not right for a man uh, and woman to be alone, that they should have a help meet. But I ain't going to go on any dating sites or anything like that and try. I've tried that fails. You need to be open to the only love that matters. Because with love, there's many styles of love that you can do. You can have a love of sports. How many watch the Super Bowl? Do you love football? You just, <laughs> you notice I had my hands out here. I didn't watch it. I, I haven't watched it in years. I, I do like the commercials, though. Sometimes the commercials are really funny. Sometimes I think a lot of people watch the Super Bowl just to see the commercials. <laughs> and hope, it's like what they say about a hockey game. They go to a fight and hope a hockey game breaks out. <laughs> but you can have love of sports, baseball, football, anything, you know. You can have love of a wife, a spouse, husband, wife. You can have, and, and, and this is where it gets dangerous, because you can have a love of money. And they say money is the root of all evil, right? It's the love of money is the root of all evil. Because it says, Jesus himself says, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And to render unto God what is God's. Which means you should pay your taxes. 
He says to submit yourself to the authorities that are placed above you unless they go against God. Then they have to deal with God. You can have a love of many things. But some of the best love that you can have is a love of a parent to a child. I mean, because it's like my mom would always explain to me the day she, she held me first. I mean, now, I have to say, I love my mom very dearly. And I hurt her when I was born. I wasn't a very big baby. I mean, I was pretty good size, but not overly huge. But the problem was, is you know how a baby would come out folded and stuff? No, I came out locked, square shoulder, like a linebacker. Never did end up playing football. But I came out, so you know, and, and, and I heard her. But she said that holding me in her arms just wiped away all of that exterior pain. My dad, growing up, did he punish me? Yes, more than once if I had my butt tanned by him. But it did not make me fear him. I felt loved, safe. Warm with my family, my mom, my dad, and my sister. Well, you know how sisters and brothers, you know, they. But yes, we spouted, we fought, we punched each other. I smacked her in the face with a brick and a skillet. But we loved each other. And we stayed in contact. How much more can you think that God loves his children? God loves us as his children. And what happens, how many of you growing up did something to make your parents, my example was my mom, really break down? Have you ever done something like that? I was teen, late teens, and we had a little dog. We always called him Puppy. He was an old, uh, oh, this time here, he was probably 8, 10 years old. But even all the way up to he was 15, we only called him Puppy. So we had a little dog, Puppy. And, of course, he was by the door doing the dance, saying, I got to go, I got to go, let me out. And at our place, we, you didn't just open the door and let him run. No, you leash and walk him because it was not very good neighborhood. So anyway, Mom was like, John, take dog out. Take puppy out. And I'm interested in this. You know, I was in love with this show I was watching. I was like, I'll, I'll get it, I'll get it. John, take dog out. I will, I will, I will. Well, he was about ready to let go out on the floor. Mama snatches him and leash on there and takes him out. I'll get him, I'll get him. And I rush right out of her, and I'm nagging at her. I'm just... Oh, screaming at her. I snatched the dog's leash out of her hands and run down. Now, my mom is just tall, okay? And we had stairs, steps up to the house. She was on like the third step, which put her face to face with me. Pow! Right across the face. Slap didn't hurt me, really. But the look on my mom's face tore me to pieces. She had never hit me in the face. Hit me plenty of times on the bottom, but never hit me in the face. And I realized then that there is great love. And yet, I stood there and shoved it back in her face. You think we did that with God? We sure did. All the way back in Deuteronomy, God informs Moses to write a song. It's kind of weird, you know, but it's a song for Israel. It says, now therefore write you this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song 
may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Whoa, John, what are you talking about against the children of Israel? This is God who used Moses to go to the children of Israel and show him his love for them that he brings them out. Well, let's look at that. How does he show his love? He said he would harden the Pharaoh's heart that the Pharaoh would not let the children go, let his people go. If God loved us so much, why didn't he just go in and and when Moses went in there to tell Pharaoh and and, and he could soften Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh go, no, this is so sweet, this is so, oh, go, be free. But no, God himself said, I'm going to harden his heart. Why? Tough love? good enough reason for me it's to show the wonders of God and what he can do and so the plagues he brought down on Egypt to pound Pharaoh's emotions and yet with God's love the land of Goshen the land of the Hebrews where the Hebrew children lived they didn't suffer there was one plague that they did suffer. And that was the death of the firstborn. For those, I don't know how many, did not obey God's word, because it really doesn't say in the Bible, but I don't know how many, but it said that if you did not put the blood of the lamb on the posts and lentil of the doorway, if you put that on there, the angel of death will Passover, hence the name Passover, Passover this house. doesn't tell how many did not, refused. So that was the one plague that did shadow over the land of Goshen. The others did not. The fireballs come down, said, but the land of Goshen did not. The locusts leading, uh, eating everything that they could see and, and feel and touch and hear, but the land of Goshen didn't suffer. The blood of water in the blood. All the water that was in Egypt, except for the land of Goshen. God's love. And yet here we say, For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that flows with milk and honey, they shall have eaten and filled themselves, wax and fat, and they will turn to other gods. Serve them, provoke me, and break my covenant. Wow. What kind of love return are we showing to the person, the man, the being who created all that is and created us? And yet here we, Moses is being told to sing this song because God says, I know you're going to do it. Moses didn't get into the promised land, right? Why did he not get into the promised land? He had serious anger issues. He failed to go to anger management courses. Well, you look at it. The people of Israel, again, crying out against God, saying, oh, we're going to die of thirst out in this desert. Be it better, we were still in Egypt and slaves and had water to drink. And Moses is like, come on, people. Didn't you see God's power? Didn't you see the parting of the Red Sea? How much more does he have to show you he loves you? But no, here we are. Oh, I'm thirsty. Oh, I'm hungry. Better be a slave and have this and than to die out here and free. And doesn't that sound weird today? Kind of like what's going on today. Better be a slave to the government and slave to all this than to be free. Was it Benjamin Franklin that once said that those who give up liberty for security have none? I'm not saying to go out and revolt against the government. But we sure can vote. We can express our freedom uh, right there in the polling stations. 
but we show our love in such strange ways. Yes, we got parents who show tough love to us, who punish us. I don't, I didn't do nothing wrong, and yet I got the baseball that broke the window. Can I admit it was just an accident? Come on. Don't try to bury and cover it over. Just admit to it. Been there, done that. Had the punishment. God punish, will punish us or allow things to happen as he did with David. When David oh, disobeyed him, one of the times he disobeyed him, God said, don't number my people. Do not number my people. In other words, don't take a census. What does David do? Takes a census. Counts his people. Counts the Israelites. God's like, all right, smarty pants. Because you have disobeyed me, you get to choose the punishment for Israel. Um... How would you like to be able to choose the punishment for a whole race of people? Especially people you're supposed to care for and lead. So he gives them a few choices, a couple of choices. Shall I raise up the Chaldeans and uh, overcome Israel and the children of Israel and have them put the sword and taken in, ca in captivity? Or shall I have a plague come across the land and the people? David repented of what he'd done, knowing, though, that it's not going to stop the consequences. He said, as I stand here, repentant to you for what I have done, do not let my people, your people, fall into the hands of our enemy. So God says, fine, plague it is. <laughs> Kill the third of the Israelites. And then right there on the threshing floor, when David repented, fully accepting all of the consequence God said here's where the plague ends by this threshing floor make an altar unto me so he goes to the person and says I want to buy your threshing floor the guy says no you're the king I give it to you and says no ain't going to do that again ain't going to disobey my lord again well until the next time <coughs> but he says I will buy with for a reasonable price, and he does. I, don't, I, I think it says it in there, what he paid for it, but I can't remember it. So. But it says here that Moses is singing this song, that they will turn to other gods after they have eaten and filled themselves, and they'll serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song will testify, shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land, I swear. Now, you'd think that that would be enough, wouldn't it? you think that that would be enough to show them that, hey, this is not playing around. But, hey, guess what? We got to go to Isaiah. Isaiah, it says in chapter 1, that the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Here we are doing it again. Okay, truth time. Kids, when you were kids, how many of you rebelled against your parents? I'm not talking about full rebellion and stuff. Maybe that was the case. But I'm talking about, you know, they say don't do something or to do something. And you do exactly the opposite. Right here. My sister, she'll admit to it. And here we go again. Israel disobeying God. Going across. Go back to Deuteronomy where the song says, I know what you're going to do. You're going to turn against me. 
Here I am doing everything. How much does God love us? How did he form and make everything before us? How did he form everything? He spoke it out. Day and night, he spoke it. Said, let there be day. Boom. So it was good. Let there be land. Let the land and the sea, or the firmament. Let the firmament and the sea be separated. Let there be beasts of the air, or on the, uh, beasts on the land, birds in the air, bugs, creeping things, blah, blah, blah. He spoke it. How did he make us? Reach down from the dirt he created. The dirt he spoke out, reached down, formed us. And I can see him forming me. There you go. There, that's John. But forming, shaping. Hmm? And then, breathes the life into us. That's how much he loves us. He took that extra time. And here we are, rebelling against him again. It says, the ox knows not his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. I'm sorry, the ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider. A sinful nation, people, Laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, and they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they are gone away backwards. Now, we're talking in a time where we had sacrifices. That for certain sins, you sacrifice this. You had doves, other clean birds. You had the lamb. And it says to be the, uh, a perfect, unblemished lamb. How many of you bet that it wasn't? Bullocks, oxen, they had everything that had certain things had to be sacrificed. Job, he would sacrifice uh, unto the Lord and then make another sacrifice just in case his sons may have said something wrong against the Lord. But now Job was doing it right. He was sacrificing and doing obedience the way God wanted from his heart. These guys now are like, oh, I did this? Yeah, go get a bullock out of the pen. Take it to the Levites. They meant nothing to him. And God reflects this. It says, your country is desolate. This is verse 7 out of Isaiah chapter 1. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And in verse 10, he really starts, as I say, ripping Israel a new one. You all know that phrase, right? You ever had your parents rip you a new one? The boss rip you a new one? Oh, walk away, you're like... Mm. I ain't got nothing left back there. Here's God. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Now, this is God speaking through the prophet. I am full of the... I have had it to hear. How many of you heard your mom say that? Mm. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of the fed beast. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or the lambs or of the goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? You're not coming as I command. You're not coming as I told you to do. As the commandments say, you're coming because you're feeling a little bit guilty and you think you can buy your way out. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbath, this is still in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. The calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with it. With It is iniquity, even the solemn Meaning, you're gathering, you're sacrificing, you're not doing it as it's supposed to be, you're not taking any 
any uh, consequence out of it. You're not taking any leave. You're not repenting. Stop it. I've done it. I've had it. But does God I got out of here? No, He doesn't. Verse 18, after He's ripping Israel a new one. Verse 18, my, what I call my life verse. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The blood. My brother. A parent chastising his their child. And when I mean by chastising, I'm not like, you better go into the timeout. They want to go to their room nowadays. They got their Xboxes and their TVs and stuff. Me, my mom stuck me in the corner after got the butt paddled, stuck me in a corner there. Yeah. So you got your tough love. God is showing tough love. But God is love. Is he not? Take a look at Romans. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. How many have heard soldiers throwing themselves onto a grenade to save their buddies? Who knows Audie Murphy? Anyone heard the name Audie Murphy? He was an actor. He was in World War II. He gained the Congressional Medal of Honor and is the most decorated Army soldier yet. And as I stated there, I had the last words, the closing scripture in that service. And I said, let's fill the hole that was left by our friend. Let's fill it with the spirit that Bob loved, the Holy Spirit. Because it says in John In John 15, 
Verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. In verse 12 it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I love you. to know if that was the first time he said it. Because it says John, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 3, talking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Which goes right back to John 14, where it says, I am the way and the truth and the light. Romans 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be me know if that was the first time he said that thing. And for those on the internet, you can call Suncoast Haven again and talk to a chaplain here. But get that discipleship that we all need. I am not an apostle of flesh. I am just a, a missionary that spreads the word and wants to share the love of God to everyone. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for this establishment that you have placed into effect to help your children. We ask that you bless the food that we are about to partake. Lord, nourish our bodies with it, but you come and nourish our souls. Fulfill yourself into us. Glorify us as you did with your son, Jesus. And let us go singing praises unto you. Despite what's going on, despite hardships, you said that the world hates us because it hated you first. So it doesn't actually hate us, but hates you. So let us go love and show that our friends and family and our loved ones can come and join us in glory. In Jesus' name.